Hello and welcome to Matt Parker's Maths Solutions. I'm Matt Parker and the Maths Solution this time is for the Stack Folding Challenge. I've got all the uh, solutions here and you can see my screen uh, next to me there. We'll go through and see how you all did. Now I'm not going to pull apart the actual folding moves required to solve the two different arrangements because I think that's a lot of fun to work it out. I will happily say though, it does require kind of tucking one bit behind another. They're not all very simple, straightforward up and folds. Sometimes you've got to fold things behind and that actually makes it more obvious that when you're counting the total number of possible ways to fold it back up again, you've got to include some more kind of, I guess, exotic arrangements. Which is why I said try the folding challenges first before you try the meta challenge, because that's a hint when you're trying to count them. Although if you're methodical, when you're looking at the number of ways to fold it, you will have counted them all anyway. But this was quite a challenge this week. We had far fewer correct answers than normal. This is the breakdown of how many people submitted different answers. So the most common answer was there's 40 different ways to fold the bit of paper up, 138 of you. That's about like 10% of what we normally get. So wow, uh, sorry for a difficult one. Hope you enjoyed it anyway. Uh, the answer of 22 folds, 63 people sent that in. You can see 24 folds uh, all the way down. So now 5,040, you might be thinking that's a weirdly big number to have in there. That's just seven factorial. So that's the people who went, well, you're gonna have A on the top and then you've got the other seven letters to make up all eight underneath. And that's the number of ways you can arrange seven letters. So I've decided that is, that's like the definition of just giving it a go because you want the participation points. And so fair enough. Uh, you will get the participation points. Anyone who put in a non-trivial number, I think we're gonna give you participation points this week, but I've decided to give bonus participation points for people who put in slightly more effort than that. And there were so many different ways of working this out. And as you can see, there's a whole range of different possible answers. We couldn't go through and work out how everyone arrived at all these different answers, what their logic was and how valid that logic was. So what I've decided to do is you get the full 2000 points if you get the correct answer, which I'll reveal in a moment. You get the 500 participation points if you put in 5040 or any answer less common than that. And I'm just gonna use wisdom of the crowds. If you put in an answer which was more common than 5,040, which is the baseline for just giving it a go, uh, I assume because lots of people did it, there's some logical reasoning behind it. So I'm gonna give those people double participation points just because uh, so few people got the correct answer this week, which was 40. So yeah, the people who are right at the top were correct. There you are, good on you. As, as a group, you're on it. So, uh, well done, everyone is part of the group so we can all take some pride in getting 40 as the correct answer. So if A ends up face out on the top, there are 40 different ways of doing it. And as always, people sent in different ways of showing how that can be done. Some people did it by exhaustion. So Bennett here sent in a video of them folding all 40 of them. So they've already kindly sped the video up, but if I grab it, I can even go faster. They eventually fold quite systematically, uh, all 40 there. So I'll link to that below if you wanna go check it out. However, Tanner here, Tanner Watanawarun, well done. They sent through a whole slide deck showing their logic and it is just Mm, lovely, it's really, really good. So I'm gonna steal a whole bunch of their slides. So uh, Tanner, excellent work explaining it. So they went through their logic and they very much took the approach of looking at it as afterwards, if you were to cut off all the cuts, you're just gonna have this stack of cards going all the way down. And then they looked at uh, the different orderings those cards could end up from their starting positions, although they very quickly realized the orientation is irrelevant because the cards always end up in the same orientation once they've been folded into the stack. In fact, they then went through and uh, just drew them. So this is their saying, they're going to consider one uh, ordering in terms of arrangement in the stack. And so then they went through and they actually just 
started with them in the correct arrangements on the correct side, so they always end up face up in the final stack. I actually thought about it in terms of eight cards, and I thought about getting this card over onto the top left spot where it's got to end up, and you've got to like fold it over where these creases are. So you fold it over that one, and then there, and then there, and it ends up face up. Or if I'd gone, uh, let's say, down here first, and then I fold over this crease to here, and then up, it's face up. And actually, no matter what combination of things you do, it'll always end up face up over there. So actually, if you flip uh, like a checkerboard pattern like this, um, there we go. No matter how you do the folds, each of these will always end up face up once they get there. So let's say, I don't know, we do uh, this crease fold. So these two go over here and we fold everything up this way. So they all fold up like that. You can see where this is going and then we'll roll it down. That one goes over and then that one goes uh, over and of course you've now got all the cards up the same way. So then what did they do? Okay, so Tanner then realized that you're gonna have the folds and you've got the right creases which all end up on the right side of the stack once it's done. So you can see they've kind of highlighted them on the side there. And right is interesting because uh, the way the cards face, the ones on the back face the other way, so actually it's the right side of both cards on both sides of the crease. Very cool. Uh, not particularly relevant. If you don't follow that, it's fine. Just at the end of the day, they're on the right side of the stack once you've finished uh, folding. You've then got the ones which end up on the left side of the stack, and it's just those two. Interesting. And then you've got the ones on the bottom. There are none on the top. Quite a few people spotted this when whatever folding they did, there were no creases at the top of the deck. And that's quite handy when you're trying to count the number of combinations. So uh, Tanner here's now got all the ones at the bottom. You've now got to work out how many different ways you can arrange those creases. And the big thing is that while they can kind of be nested, importantly, what they can't do is cross. You can't have a crease cross. Crease cross. Ah, oh, Tanner's put uh, insert cha-cha slide reference here. Huh, I don't know what that means. I mean, it is a slide. It's part of the presentation. But I don't know about um, what that's got to do with crease cross. Huh. Crisscross. There you go. Uh, personally, I would have pointed out that the creases have to uh, jump, jump, but you know, that's just me. I'm old. So anyway, once you realize that you can't have the creases crossing, you then uh, reduce it down to the number of cases where you have uh, arrangements on the different sides such that it all holds together, and you get 40. Great work, um, Tanner, on the mats. Uh, so uh, Andy uh, did a similar thing. Let's get Andy's one here. Again, realized you got the different uh, types of creases and the directions they can go in, and then went through and worked out exactly which combinations. There were some fantastic diagrams um, from Andy, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, Sean, this I'll link to the video here. Sean did a fantastic video uh, explaining the logic very carefully and very clearly. So if you want to go uh, check that out, I'll link to it in the description. I've taken off the audio, but uh, Sean's talking over all of this, doing some uh, great maths, and then shows again, you kind of the creases crossing, and then eventually the logic behind how you count up how many different arrangements there are. So great work, um, Sean. Uh, and then uh, this fantastic paper actually breaks down the frequency of where the different letters can end up. So if I uh, zip along later on, here we go. There's like a breakdown of where the letters end up and how likely a letter is to be in any given position, which I thought was a really nice breakdown and worth including. So that's below. Now Tom here went above and beyond and quite a few people did some coding. So well done everyone who did a bunch of programming and they were able to generate uh, using code, how many different ways you could solve this for different sized grids of folded paper. So that what we're doing now is the two by four case. We've just got the eight individual rectangles and you can see there are two by four gives you 40. And then they've done other ones. And everyone who used code to try and do this for different sized grids at some point hit the limits of what their processor can do. I think Tom, got the most. So well done, Tom. You've either got the most efficient programming or the most powerful computer or the most amount of computing resources and time you're prepared to throw at an otherwise reasonably pointless problem. But aren't all the best problems 
reasonably pointless. Uh, so well done, Tom. Interesting, Tom, uh, notice the top row is in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, whereas the other rows are not. And uh, other people did mention that as well. So thank you everyone who uh, clocked on the top one. That's if you just got a long string of things that can kind of fold up. And that's actually called a stamp problem in mathematics. Whereas once you've got more than one row all folding, it becomes a map problem. And as like Tom noticing that not all these lists were in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences kinds of hints at the fact that some of this is not yet fully known or understood. And that's a great thing to have. A puzzle that starts with just folding a piece of paper ends up with mass we don't even know yet. And on Twitter, a um, mate of mine, uh, Robin, tweeted about the puzzle. Very nice. Thank you, Robin. Oh, Robin, you may know if you've watched my videos about super permutations. So that's why they may seem familiar. There you go. Uh, they then pointed out, like all good puzzles, it leads very quickly to an unsolved mathematical problem. Uh, they also then uh, talked a bit about the history of this problem. So actually, this folding paper problem first came up uh, a guy called uh, Dudeney, who made amazing puzzles back in the early uh, 20th century. They first came up with some of these arrangements to try and fold it. I didn't mention that in the puzzle video, because if you then Google them, it always gives away the number 40 for some reason. Whereas I thought finding that number was actually the more interesting puzzle. So I didn't want to give that away in advance. And Martin Gardner wrote about this in 1971. So that's like half a century ago. So this puzzle is somewhere between 150, between 150 years um, old. And there's a bit of it we still don't know. And that's just the number of ways that you can fold up one of these bits of paper. So ignore the letters, ignore what I insisted was on the top. If you throw away that and just generalize it completely, you get the map folding problem. And we do not know for maps greater than seven by seven, if they're a square arrangement, how many ways you can fold them up. Isn't that crazy? And so Robin then tweeted a screen grab from the Wikipedia article. I'll link to Robin's tweets and the Wikipedia article below. So we don't know. There you are. If you want to do some new maths, can you work it out for eight by eight? It's going to be a big old number. Oh, spoiler, it's going to take a while. But hey, that's what we do around here. So if you want to give it a go, no one's done it for the last. Uh, so Martin Gardner did mention this in 71. So no one's done it in half a century. Get onto it. How hard can it be? Very hard. Right. Um, so I thought that was a really nice thing to throw in from Robin. Uh, and I love the fact that when I found this puzzle, I first of all loved folding the bit of paper. And it's an old puzzle, and people have loved doing that for a long time. Uh, but yet, it goes from a very old folding paper puzzle right through to some mathematics we still don't know. Lovely. Um, the one final thing I wanted to uh, end on. Oh, and again, thanks so much to everyone who helps out with the puzzles. Uh, it's been really good fun putting this together. And thank you, everyone, who gets involved sending in solutions. Uh, it's, it's amazing, as always, to go through your work. So sorry if you sent something in. I didn't get a chance to include it. The last thing I want to include, though, was uh, Hagen, Hagen uh, sent in an animation. This is the second one. So if you haven't done that one yet, from the first video, look away, spoilers. They sent an animation. Cause this one, I don't know, people found this more or less difficult. Depends how you do the folds. They've made it look particularly bad, but you know what, it is an awful fold at the end if you do it this way. So you can see to solve this one, you kind of roll it up like that, but then uh, you got to peel that right back. It's just, it's not pretty. But I just thought that was an unnecessarily complicated and exciting video showing that. So I thought I would include it. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for getting involved with these and we'll have another puzzle out soon.